Thank you. Madam Chair, no, there are none. The, there is only an addition of um, a presentation to item 6.1, but since there's only the two items on the agenda, there's no need to move it up to presentations. Which is okay, thank you. May I have a motion, please, to approve the agenda as presented? All those in favor? Sure. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Seeing none. Approval of the minutes, please, for June the 1st, 2017. Councillor Jackson, Councillor Vanderbeek, all those in favor. Sure. Thank you. Discussion items, Art Gallery of, Can of Canada, of Hamilton Review of the Financial Requirements, uh, GRA 17009, Citywide Outstanding Business li uh, List Item. John Hertel will provide the presentation for item 6.1. Are there any questions of, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Good afternoon, John, again.
Retail operations haven't been profitable since inception, and the rental space, due to the lack of amenities like kitchen facilities and the just, it's a very, it's a, it's a small room that can't host larger events. It hasn't been able to be profitable since inception. Management is currently taking measures to uh, generate additional seventy thousand dollars in savings from this uh, at the annex. So comparative galleries, so this is where it gets a little bit interesting. The AGH compares well to provincial galleries. When we're comparing galleries, the two thing, key things that we look at is the collection size and the square footage of the facilities, as those are the main two cost drivers. In terms of their collection size and the, the size of the building, the AGH compares much better to provincial style galleries than it does to a municipal style gallery. And in terms of the operation budget, $6 million is more in line with some of the uh, provincial galleries than it is with a municipal gallery, which on average is around $2.5 million. So the AGH base funding is currently at 17%. The only form of base funding they get is from the CEF, which is the City Enrichment Fund, with all funds coming from, obviously, us. And the industry average for government base funding is between 30 and 50%. So there's a significant shortfall between what an average uh, gallery gets in the industry and what they're receiving as base funding. So the uh, AGH has taken steps to kind of address this. They have put applications forth for both provincial and federal base funding. The applications are currently pending. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, due to the, the underfunding of government-based uh, government funding, they have about a $500,000 deficit each year. And this is a, a visual of where the AGH compares with other comparative galleries. If you take a look, the, the red box is this uh, gallery, our gallery of Hamilton. The light blue is their operating budget, and that compares well to like the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Nova, Nova Scotia Art Gallery, the Gallery of Alberta. And if you take a look at the blue ch uh, chart, the bar graph, it's, it shows how much of their funding is from government-based funding. They're much lower than most comparable galleries, and they're at 17%, whereas the majority of them are hovering around the 35 to 45, 50% range. Uh, this just gives you some key, key metrics that the AGH was able to provide us. In terms of government-based funding, we had mentioned they're at 17%. The uh, uh, industry average is between 30 and 50. Earned revenue, they, they earn about 50% of their revenue compared to industry average of about 33%. And salaries as a percentage of the operating budget, they're at about 38%, whereas the industry average is 47%. So these kind of metrics would indicate that they are operating very efficiently in terms of, in terms of industry standards. And that kind of concludes the presentation and open it up to any questions. Thank you. I have Councillor uh, Jackson. Thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Tamim and John, thank you uh, very much. Can you, Tamim, just go back a couple of slides to um, comparative galleries, please? Yep. For me, thank you, uh, Tamim. And you and John did everything we asked you to do in bringing this uh, review forward at this time. Um, so, how much do they get from uh, the provincial or federal governments? Through you, Madam Chair? Tamim? Through the Chair. Currently, they're receiving zero base funding from the federal and provincial levels of government. Well, Councilor? here's part of our problem. All due respect to the art gallery, Madam Chair, and since amalgamation, I'd like to think, in spite of reservations from time to time, I've been there supporting them. The capital campaign, John, to me, before you guys arrived, about 10 years ago, if memory serves me right, about a 15 to $20 million earmark from municipal government for the expansion, the capital campaign, the new front windows, the sign on King, et cetera. Uh, the landscaping out back, fronting on Maine. Anyways, so here we are, a guaranteed literally million dollars a year for the gallery, basically over the last, since amalgamation, I'll say, if I'm off by a couple of years, I apologize, and zero money from the federal provincial governments. Is the new executive director, and she's inherited this, so you've got to give her time, but as Ms. Faulkner, as the board of directors, are they doing, John, to me, to your knowledge, something about this? Uh, through the chair, from, a, I'll say, an operations point of view, and, and I'm certainly no art critic, but from a business point of view, when we review their, uh, both their strategic plan and their operations plan, they're really on the right uh, targets for moving this forward. And one of the main areas that they're working very aggressively on right now, specifically the CEO, Shelley Faulkner, is on securing provincial and or uh, federal funding. 
from our simple, even if we didn't do this as a recommendation report, but uh, when we, I'll say, make the observations, uh, big check marks for the operational side of the business and the changes that they're making, really uh, focusing on the core business, uh, getting more engaged in the community, being more diversified, uh, honoring and recognizing the regional and local uh, aspects of both the gallery, <clears throat> excuse me, and their target audience. Uh, so all of that gets a big check mark. The big gap to us, as you point out, uh, Councillor Jackson, is that there is no other source of base funding right now on a, on a sustained basis. What they have been getting from the feds or province have been very project specific. So usually they would be capital projects that they're doing. They apply for a grant and it could be a, a shared expense. So, you know, a matching kind of grant, but that's the only consistent uh, source of federal or provincial funding so far, but they are aggressively working towards that. Thank you, Councilor. Well, I'm, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm glad and encouraged cautiously uh, to hear that with the new executive director, it makes you wonder, I mean, all this time's gone by and I mean, you know, that would be so much easier for the municipality as well if we just did project oriented as well for the gallery and that million dollars, uh, so many other groups out there. And so I'm in cautiously encouraged, John, and I'd like to, uh, John, on that point, if, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we need to have from time to time an update. Mm -hmm. I know we're not her, Shelley's board. She reports directly to her board. I think Councillor Pearson's our rep. I don't, we used to have two. Did we appoint a second one or is it just Councillor Pearson? Uh, we did, I believe, uh, through the chair. Uh, I believe Councillor Vandevik, you were on the board and then um, resigned from the board and Councillor Pearson is the current uh, single council representative. So we didn't replace Councillor Vanderbeek then. So we, we still only have one. Correct, okay, so anyway, so um, let's hope with the uh, board and the new executive director, they make some inroads with the, I mean, it's, it's just mind boggling to me that the province and feds, if this is one of the oldest, largest galleries in the country, that they haven't come forward at this time with some sustainable funding, like the municipality has done, which mu much more limited resources. Um, how about membership, John, to me, were you able to gather I've always, and maybe it's a little more traditional and possibly a little outdated, uh, but I've always felt any organization, and even in a digital way, any organization that has a solid base of members, paid up members, contributing members, volunteer members, I have found in my lifetime and in politics, they are usually some of the most successful any idea of their membership, John? And even if, as it like ebbed and flowed over the years, is it down dramatically? Is it held steady? Any idea between you and Tamim? Uh, Thank the, you, John. The, through the chair, the uh, the one part I'm familiar with is their, um, uh, I'll say, the attendance of tours through uh, children, uh, school children. And that number has hovered uh, pretty steadily around 9,000. Um, as a sidebar, when uh, spoke to uh, uh, CEO uh, Shelley Faulkner about what that number represents. It's not quite the same number as attends one kid's hockey game for the Bulldogs each year. So they have a very specific uh, plan to expand the uh, both at the elementary, uh, uh, high school and post-secondary involvement uh, for having uh, those kind of um, uh, very extensive tour groups through. But as far as pure membership, I'm going to ask Tamim if uh, he recalls that from the operations review. So based on our conversations with the finance manager, from 2016 to 2015, there was an increase in membership revenue. And uh, also, in terms of comparing to the industry, they do generate about 50% of their revenues uh, they, uh, internally, they, not like not donations or, I mean, not grants or whatnot. So they are a little bit higher than the industry average when it comes to earned revenue. So they are, uh, I guess, aggressively pursuing uh, those kind of things. And in terms of, as John had said, they're moving away from a focus on the arts curriculum and kind of going to like genocide studies and history studies and kind of uh, developing those relationships with the school boards to kind of expand and grow their, their uh, education department because that's where they see the majority of the growth coming in for the gallery. So to me, can you, and again, beyond today and through our appointed representative, Councillor Pierce, I'm glad she's, uh, she's arrived. 
we were just talking about the provincial feds, how they've been lacking over the years in providing, but your new executive director is aggressively pursuing that, which is encouraging. So is there any way, gentlemen, you can take under advisement? I'd like to see a hard and fast, even a five-year average of membership and what kind of revenue that membership brings in. That 9,000 you mentioned, though, John, that was a one-time tour type of thing. That was a 9,000 members, was it, or was it? Uh, excuse me, through the chair, it's, it's an annual number of uh, school tours that oh, come that's through. school tours. Okay. But as far as pure membership, we'd be happy to uh, secure from the, Could the you team please, at the gallery what Madam the Chair, stat, that, the that'd be great. That, for sure. um, yeah, could you go back in slides? I don't have pages, unfortunately, here, Tamim. Uh, the slide that has deficit reduction plan. Can you go back a few there, please? Just quick. There it is. Thank you. Um, okay, measures taken at the annex. Just help me understand. Is that an off site premise that the gallery owns, Madam Chair, through you? Yes, through the chair, it's, it's a property that they're leasing on James North uh, called the Design Annex, and they've tried a, a variety of different, uh, I'll say, combinations of bringing the gallery to the community through that particular venture. It is, it is not proven to be um, a profit maker, for sure, so they've taken steps recently and, and have more plans uh, on the books okay. to uh, bring that uh, around to be uh, a, at a minimum neutral if not profit making. Okay, hence that amount up there, I guess, is going in that direction of what you just indicated, John. That's correct. That's a step towards it. Okay, who owns the collections at the gallery? I've heard that we own some, they own some, Tannenbaum owns some. Who owns the collections, John? So it's an interesting question through the chair and, and one that I know uh, Anna and her team and we've had many discussions uh, both with legal uh, and uh, of course the gallery's uh, legal advisors as well. It is our understanding, and I'm going to ask Anna to correct me if I'm wrong, that the city owns some of the collection pre-1967. The gallery owns the collection post-1967. And I'll look to Anna for a nod, and I'm getting a positive nod. So the last 50 years, the gallery owns anything that's come in pre-67, the city owned it? That is correct, through the chair. Wow, what, a, what an interesting uh, conundrum there, uh, um, a mix of ownership. Um, last uh, slide, that one, uh, Tamim, you've got the 1516 business, business unit analysis. Thank you. So all the pinkish up there is kind of like deficit. Is that what I'm seeing there? So That's Department of Administration, 685 grand deficit showing, Tamim? So yeah, the, uh, through the chair, that that business unit does not have a strong source of revenue. So it, it's basically a cost center. There's not a lot of revenues coming in to that, to that unit. The only f source of income coming in is through the investment account. So anything, any income they generate in their investment account is applied against, against that business unit, but it's majority a cost center. Okay. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, if you allow me a closing comment. John, again, as I stated before, Councillor Pearson came in and she's been an excellent advocate for the gallery for a number of years she's been appointed there. Um, my closing comment, John, and to me, for what my opinion's worth as your continuing dialogue moving forward. And when the Arts Task Force was set up, we heard from a lot of groups, I could name a number of them, and I won't, who, if you will, in a competitive way, always felt like they were at the short end of the municipal funding stick. And the gallery just, you know, nice charmed life uh, for since amalgamation, give or take, almost can rely on an annual million dollars, didn't have to file applications, set in stone. And I was there, so I'm not, I'm not you know, exonerating myself from uh, supporting it in the initial stages. Good lobby group came in of citizens, board of director members, a couple of former mayors made a good pitch, and the former executive director, uh, uh, well informed and, and brought a lot of talent to the table. But as the years went along, John, and to me, Madam Chair, I got to a point where every budget, I was kind of questioning, this is continuously automatic. It's wrong that it's continuously automatic unless they're going through the process like everyone else. And you know, John, in the last year or two, we've increased the arts funding by about a half a million a year through the work of the task force and your staff and Director of Culture and Tourism, Anna Bradford's staff. 
And many of those groups said, hey, we're, we're kind of forgotten here as one or two big ones seem to be getting the lion's share in the arts uh, category, in the arts envelope. So my closing message, John, is it can't be par for the course anymore for the gallery. Um, the automatic million a year, no worry about going through application process, not worrying about seeking other levels of funding, relying literally on this one level of government. For me, those days are over. So Madam Chair, just uh, my closing comment to you, John, um, has that kind of messaging already started to be conveyed? Thank you, Councillor, and through the Chair, um, for just to, um, I guess, put it in context uh, to some degree, uh, prior to the establishment or you know, sort of redesign of the City Enrichment Fund, uh, they were part of the boards and agencies uh, category and really didn't have any uh, oversight, I'll say, uh, from the city in terms of the, the kind of uh, detailed uh, review that we've been doing the last few years. So they've actually gone through the city enrichment process the last three years. And they've been adjudicated uh, and have scored very well. So in, in its simplest uh, context of the city enrichment fund where they now sit, uh, they've scored 80 or above. Uh, they've met the, the broad criteria of being less than 30%, in fact, it's 17% of their budget. But from a, a business point of view and an operations point of view, as you indicated earlier, to us the biggest gap is the uh, lack of provincial or federal base funding. Uh, so I think when I look at it again from an operations point of view, and I see the work that they've done in terms of establishing a new strategic plan and operating plan, if you ever do get an opportunity to read the attachment, it's actually a really, really well done plan. Uh, and as long as they hit those targets, you'd have to give them a check mark, I'll say for doing all the right things from an activity point of view. We hope that they're successful in getting the provincial and federal funding. Uh, but I, I think they feel somewhat comfortable being part of the City Enrichment Fund uh, because we're doing this analysis together. They've been very, very supportive and would be very willing to come back and do and give us the information, for example, to do regular updates at the sort of the choosing of subcommittee as far as the frequency, et cetera. And I know um, the uh, CEO, Shelley Faulkner, could do a far better job of describing her strategic plan and operating plan than I can. But I do have uh, a strong uh, sense of um, uh, support uh, in the way that we see what they're doing. So we, we're quite encouraged by it. So, John, Madam Chair, forgive me. So just what something John said, then I just want to uh, conclude with, uh, just um, subsequent to what you just said, John. So I'm glad the last three years they've been in the CEF process. So I can then presume moving forward, unlike years gone by when we questioned the annual million and the fallback position of the board of the AGH and the previous CEO was, Council, you set up that indefinitely, that million. That excuse and rationale is no longer in front of us. Correct, John? Madam Chair, through you? Uh, through the chair, not quite. Oh, well, <laughs> see, now that's what I'm getting so, at. So what, uh, as uh, sorry, I'll say step one, uh, we've done this review to try to ourselves better understand uh, the, the unique requirements of a gallery. It's, it's more like a museum, I'll say, than uh, if I were to compare it to, uh, say, Theatre Aquarius and, and the kind of uh, physical requirements they have versus a gallery, very, very different. So I think when now we, we understand the operation well enough to, uh, to feel comfortable that a million dollars is certainly needed. Uh, can they do different things to offset that in terms of federal and provincial? Absolutely. Should they continue to find additional revenue sources and improve the business? Absolutely. With specific reference to the uh, ongoing million dollars, uh, it's our understanding, and, and I'll ask maybe Stephanie to clarify, um, when we've reviewed this in the past, it's our understanding that because it was in a report approved by council now 10 years ago, I think roughly, uh, Councillor Jackson, that an, until another report would come forward recommending something different than that, then that would continue on. So it doesn't preclude uh, subcommittee and, and committee and council 
uh, for recommending something different in a report. But until that were done, it would remain the same. Is that correct, uh, Stephanie? Excuse me for just a second. I think the clerk would like to chime in. Please. If you don't mind. Three Please. Madam, uh, Stephanie. Three, Madam Chair. Just for clarification, um, that's close, but there is a slight twist. Um, the resolution that was put forward 10 years ago, and I'm just guesstimating the time to do 11, or sorry, a million dollars annually, could be changed in any term of council past that without a reconsideration without a reconsideration because the resolution was passed in a previous term. So if committee wants to change that, we would go forward and amend that original report at a council meeting. I would prepare a resolution for that. Um, it wouldn't go to grant subcommittee for that. You would, at that point, go forward, make an amendment if you wanted to, or like John said, if you could put something completely different, different forward, but we would still need to clean up that $1 million a year. Okay. Just through an amending motion, but it wouldn't require reconsideration if it was in a different term of council. Thank you. Councillor? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Floor Stephanie, for chiming in from a legislative standpoint. And, John, I appreciate. Thank you for um, reaffirming a little bit of my concern that there still are, if you will. So it's almost like the gallery, at my words, as the best of both worlds. Yeah, they're now in the CFE process the last three years but they've got this 10-year-old arrangement agreement with the city that all else fails in CEF, they've got their indefinite million dollars a year. So I'd like to, pending the comments and opinions of the rest of my colleagues, at some point in time, John, I'd like to say that the, um, the luxury of having that million indefinitely forever those days are over and they're truly in 100% in the CEF process mm -hmm. like everybody else is at some point in time with Stephanie's help and your help with the wording. And if committee and council ultimately, Madam Chair, want to go in that direction, I think we need to remove that ambiguity because it looks like they've got currently the best of both worlds, John. And if, I, if my interpretation is inaccurate, please just you know, conclude by telling me so or my kind of interpreting correctly. I think you are correct, sir. Through the Thank you. Chair. Okay. Councilor thank you very much, Madam thank Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Green, can you take the uh, chair for me, please? And thank you, Councillor Jackson, for your questions. And you were on the same boat that I was on. And it comes back to process adjudication. And you said they scored very well. With all due respect, so did Super Crawl. So did Peach Festival. And we could probably take the top 10, Theatre Aquarius. Mm -hmm. Um, but during the adjudication, that's when it was decided how much money would be recommended. So that's the one piece of the adjudication that's missing here. You're comfortable, that's great, but I still would like to see them be compared in that art adjudication that they've been put under. And I would still like to see that as well. Um, I think it's slide seven to me. Could you please go back? I've tried to calculate. There we go. So. If, if I heard you correctly, in 2015, they were able to sell um, a piece of, of art, and they are now $6 million in the good. And then 2016, they're 829000 not in the good. So what do their reserves look like? If this was a $6 million asset, and then it went right almost to a $1 million deficit the very next year. So do they have reserves? What do their reserves look like? Uh, post selling the actual artwork, they do have some board restricted funds. So the, the funds that uh, the sale of the collection, all the funds are majority of the funds are in a board restricted fund, and therefore the main uh, because of the, the dollars came from the sale of the collection, it's restricted for the maintenance of the collection. Okay, so again, they're now in an eight hundred and twenty nine thousand dollar five hundred and fifty three deficit at two, as according to two thousand sixteen. Okay. So a quick question that came to mind was, I can remember in the past that we actually refused grants because there was such a deficit in the organization, in any organization. Um, so again, adjudication would be very good here. It would it'd actually compare apples to apples for most of the, the um, ones that we have. And if you go to slide 10, this was up earlier with Councillor Jackson. If I add all this up, it's 390,000. And it just about about a third, maybe just less than a third of, of what their actual deficit is. So it's still not going to address their ongoing deficit, correct? Correct. It, it would address a portion of the deficit, but not the entire deficit. 
Okay, thank you. And utility cost savings, they don't pay city taxes, correct? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not too sure if they do pay city taxes. Uh, on a million dollar <laughs> no. downtown prime. No. Okay, I'm just asking. Okay, so th that was that. Hang on a sec. So if the art gallery is successful in, in applying to the provincial and federal governments, which is way long overdue, does that then, again, question for the adjudicators, does that then adjust the amount we give them? Because my understanding is that they, that most grants that you get from higher levels of government are not to be used for operations. They're to be used for capital, uh, specific programs, but not operational, correct? If I may, um, it would appear, and, and again, this is not something that uh, I would claim to be expert in, but when you look at some of the funding models of other galleries, it does appear that uh, the province, particularly in some cases, is providing a base funding for the overall operation of the gallery. Okay, well that's good to hear. So again, my comment would be that if they went through a proper adjudication that all the other organizations do, then that may come into play. It may show that they deserve more. It may show that they deserve less. So I think one of the reasons why I was really pushing for having everyone under one umbrella was because we seem to have three, three levels of, of funding. You would have the one where the, the council would come in on the fly and, and get the grant. The next one was most of the organizations came in with a package this thick, had to go through Rosanna and the teams to, to make sure they dotted all the, the I's and crossed all the T's. And then the third level was all they had to do was stand at the podium with wearing a nice tie and saying, here we are. So this is why I, we kept pushing for the adjudication to be consistent for everyone. So I will take the chair back. Thank you very much. Councillor Jackson. Oh, Councillor Pearson. Yep, no. Thank you. Just as a representative um, on the art gallery, I just I apologize for not making it sooner. Unfortunately, I had a, I've got a flooding issue that I was dealing with. And, um, but I'm sure John and Tamine covered this off, and I want to thank them and Anna Bradford. Um, I know this has been a difficult situation. I know the art gallery appreciates everything that has been done to assist over the years. Um, they are tremendous custodians of the art that has been donated to the art gallery and some of it to the city of Hamilton as has been raised earlier because not all of the collection is owned by the city of Hamilton and it's quite a convoluted sort of process to how things changed back in the late 60s and I wasn't around then to know what happened with city council at the time. So um, I'm just uh, certainly supportive of going forward and I, and I know um, Shelley Faulkner is uh, doing her best. She's already had meetings with the province and the feds in, in, in getting, a, getting a better fairness of assistance from the other levels to reduce the burden of what, um, you know, what they're coming from the city of Hamilton for every year. So I know that's being done. I know she's taken very, very big steps in, tr in getting this deficit down and dealing with the future um, grants that, uh, that will secure the art gallery going for forward in the future. So I just want to thank everybody here and certainly hope that we can continue to support the art gallery. I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, but I know just in, uh, in one point, not sure of the taxes. I don't think we've ever discussed taxes at the art gallery, property taxes, because the land is owned by the city. That's right. So, um, so I'm not sure if there's a building component of it, but the land is owned by the city that the building sits on. And uh, just in the HVAC, and security, I know some of it's mentioned in some of the slides here, it's over half a million dollars a year that's required just to preserve yep. um, the service, the system there. So just putting that forward. Thank you, John, and to me, and Anna, thank you. And thank you. Councillor Green, one more question, if you don't mind taking the chair. The, the artifacts that are actually city owned, and maybe Anna could answer this question, because I know we have pieces and throughout all the different municipal um, centers, the, um, uh, are we paying any extra for the maintenance? Are you sending staff in? Are you taking care of this whatsoever, maintaining it whatsoever? Are you involved in this where, in fact, the million dollars could be even more so considering if you are, in fact, sending staff in to take care of what we're supposed to be owners? So through the chair, the um, pre-1967 collection is um, under the full jurisdiction of the art gallery. We do have our own civic collections, which are stored on Burlington Street, and it's a completely separate. Okay, so the, the artwork that you're discussing prior to 1967, we're not 
we're not putting any staff time into this. It's completely under their purview. They're taking care, maintaining. Okay, thank you. That was, I just want to get that clear. Councillor Green, I'll take the um, uh, chair back, and I'm going to go to Councillor Jackson. I believe you had a motion. What, what I'm going to do, Madam Chair, is I've put everyone on notice, and I'll work after today's meeting, not to catch anyone off guard, with okay. Stephanie, with John Hertel, and yourself as chair, and put together a motion that basically will bring the art gallery right into the CEF process that they've been in the last three years, and if you will, amend the 10-year-old council direction where they just automatically received it in light of the fact we've got a new process set up for everybody else. But I'll bring that forward at a future meeting. Okay, so Thank it's you. not a motion at this time, no. it's just let on notice. So I, st I do need a motion to receive the presentation, please. Motion to receive the presentation. Councillor Jackson, Councillor Green, all those in favour? Thank you. And to receive the report. I need a motion, please. Councillor Marilla, Councillor Vanderbeek, all those in favour? Thank you. So 262, please. And this is the City Enrichment Fund 2017 Community Services Stream Intake Review Follow-Up. So, are there any questions regarding 6.2? Seeing none. Seeing none. Councillor Green, Councillor Merla, seeing none. Move to receive. Thank you. So, Councillor Green, Councillor Marula, all those in favor? Thank you. We're going to 7.1. And this is the YWCA Hamilton's Transitional Living Program presented by Councillor Marula. Yeah. And it's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Jackson, whereas the YWCA Hamilton offers 65 beds for single women who are at risk of homelessness to access temporary up to one year safe housing, whereas the YWCA Hamilton's Transitional Living Program provides a valuable service annually to over 100 single women who are at risk of homelessness in our community. Whereas in 2016, the program assisted over 50 women in achieving permanent housing situations. Whereas City of Hamilton staff will continue to work with the YWCA Hamilton to review system pressures and changing funding priorities of the federal and provincial levels of government and assist with identifying alternative Alternate, alternate funding uh, opportunities and whereas the YWCA Hamilton's Transitional Living Program was the highest rated program in the 2017 Community Services stream, uh, category A, no one is hungry or without shelter of the City Enrichment Fund, therefore be it resolved that one-time funding in the amount of $60,000 for the YWCA Hamilton's Transitional Living Program be funded from the City Enrichment Fund and Reserve and be approved, and I believe uh, it speaks for itself. Okay, thank you, and Councillor Green would like to speak. Thank you very much, and with following up with staff, you'll remember my concern was this being kind of way outside of what I consider to be the policy. We uh, had, had gone through this conversation vigorously. I've given, made my uh, opinions on the reserve known. I've given my opinions on uh, the supports that we have inside community and emergency services known as it relates to their 1.8% parameter that they've been dealing with. But having met with staff and understanding that even under the block funding, this is not something that could have happened. Uh, I am comfortable in supporting this one-time anomaly uh, for the reasons that Councilor Marula has, has laid before us. And so... Um, I just wanted to go on the record and say it was because of the follow-up and the fuller, I, I, we had quite a lengthy conversation with staff about where I see some of the deficiencies are, but those are at a, at a much higher level of, with, as it relates to our budget and as it relates to the government's, the, the provincial uh, shift in the housing first policy, which has kind of left some of these NGOs uh, out in the lurch. But I, I do need to say this, Madam uh, Chair, that what I've experienced in community emergency services with these provincial shifts has nonprofits coming to the city, in a, and I'm not saying this with, with the YW specifically, but in a bit of a name and shame kind of way, that if their fundraising goes down, if the province shifts, or as I said to staff, if the province sneezes, we, we catch the cold. And I feel like that's what's happened here. Um, the urgency of this service and the need far for me outweighs 
my particular issue with how this has gone down, but it should be noted that, um, you know, in future community emergency service meetings, when the province shifts their funding models, the general public, and I think everybody needs to recognize what that means as a pressure for the municipality. It means that we end up finding reserve funds like this and other places to try to offset these pressures because this in a very real way would result in our most vulnerable women uh, potentially being you know, pushed out of these programs and into temporary day type shelters. And so for that reason, I'm supporting Councilor Marula and Councilor Jackson. It did take uh, the staff to follow up and kind of go more thoroughly through this to make sure that no stone was unturned. And I do think that there is a, a, I think a compelling case for us to revisit how we look at community emergency services in the next um, budget cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Madam Chair, just uh, piggybacking on what Councillor Green and Marula have said, um, the acting GM, Vicki Woodcox, in June presented to ECS and some of the, um, if you will, the uh, confusion over information that should have been provided, wasn't provided over the last year, lots of change in the lineups within the city department. So all that was clarified as well. Um, and, uh, and also this 60,000, we'll get them in the ballpark. It'll still be a little bit less than what they received last year annually. If memory serves me right, they got a total of about 125,000. And this will put them in the ballpark about 105 and 110. So again, within the realm, within the range, and for all the good work that the YW does in this transitional living program, I'm supportive. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's moved by Councillor Marilla, seconded by Councillor Jackson. Any questions, any comments? All those in favor? Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Are there any notices of motions? None. General information, folks, 6.1 and 6.2. According to the clerk, we need to remove them from the outstanding business list. Uh, do we still want to remove the art gallery from the business list, outstanding business list? Uh, no, that, my apologies. And we'll just remove item 6.2, the community services stream intake review. Okay, thank you. So just 6.2 removed from uh, the outstanding business list. Councillor Ferguson, welcome. And Councillor Vanderbeek, all those in favor. And may I please have a motion to adjourn? Councillor Vanderbeek, Councillor Jackson. Thank you, folks.